Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show. I am Jeff Rubin, and this week I am very excited because on the Skype phone we have John Collins, a paper airplane world record holder. Welcome to the show, John. Hey, glad to be here, Jeff. Now, what exactly is your paper airplane world record? Uh, it's for distance. Uh, there are a couple of uh, kind of high-profile paper airplane records. Um, one is time aloft or duration, and mine is for distance. Uh, it's the furthest distance uh, traveled by a paper airplane indoors. What are the other records? Time aloft is not directly related to distance necessarily is what I'm hearing? Uh, no. Uh, so that's duration. That's the amount of time your plane can stay in the air. And that's all uh, an aircraft that has a whole other set of requirements. Uh, great glide ratio would be among them. It needs to be light. It needs to have a light, uh, low sink rate, which is just essentially the speed that it's traveling toward the ground. Um, and then there's uh, simultaneous launch, which is, um, I think it's around 23,000 people all at the same time have launched a paper airplane. So, <clears throat> excuse me, and distance is, of course, uh, just a, a simple linear measurement of how far the plane goes with one throw. I, you have just thrown a lot at me. I have so many questions. I know this is just the beginning, but I, I'm already learning so much about the landscape of the paper airplane world. Where are these comp like where are these competitions? Is it just people trying to get the world record or is this like uh, are there are there competitions where people get together for this thing? Well, it's a little bit of both. Uh, you know, Red Bull is running uh, their uh, global competition right now. It has a, a different set of rules than Guinness. But uh, Guinness rules allow you to try to break anybody's record at any time. So the procedure really is write to Guinness and get the most updated set of rules uh, and then uh, start working on breaking the record. So when we're talking about, say, the distance record, what are the rules for paper airplane distance? So you get a maximum paper weight of 100 GSM. That's just a measure of how thick the paper is. Uh, what the what the total uh, weight of the paper would be, uh, you can use either eight and a half by eleven, which is U.S. letter size, or you can use international letter size, which is called A4. So for distance, A4 paper, it turns out, is a little bit about three percent uh, bigger in terms of area. So you give up a little bit of weight if you use U.S. letter size. So um, I used A4 because I didn't want to give up any weight. Um, and A4, uh, it, proportion wise, is a little bit taller than U.S. letter size, and so. That affects the folding pattern of the plane. The you know the geometry of the plane is affected by the starting uh, ratio of height to width on the paper. So um, I, I had to re-engineer my plane for that size paper. So there are, you know there are a number of sort of small technical challenges when you start getting into it. When you think about optimizing, um, you know how much weight you're going to have to work with, try to optimize the wing size to get the plane to fly best for that geometry. So uh, you know a, a couple of small technical issues going in. How competitive is – when did you set the record, and what was the record you uh, – what was the previous record that you broke? So the previous record was 207 feet 4 inches, and that had stood up for about nine years. Um, and the, the guy who set that record was only 15 years old when he did it, and, and so that actually played a large part uh, in the record. So I've been the world record holder, uh, Joe Ayub and I. Joe was my thrower. Uh, I've been the world record holder for uh, a little over a year now. We set it in uh, February of 2012. So throwing and designing the airplane, two completely different you're, – you're a team. I didn't realize that. This is, this is a team effort. It was the, really the first time uh, that a team had been tried, uh, and I came to the realization fairly quickly that I didn't have the arm to throw anything 200 feet. So actually, it, you know, it ends up being not – Exactly correct. Once I came up with this new kind of plane, this plane is the first distance plane that actually flies. The, the old method for breaking the distance record was really just to do a, a fancy looking stick with fins. So it was really just fold, get the paper as compact as you can. Uh, the wings were about an inch wide. The wingspan, the whole wingspan is about an inch. Um, they would put the wings at uh, equal uh, angles to each other. So the, if the plane rolled to one side, it didn't matter. The plane flew. If you said, think about it like fletching on an arrow, where the the feathers are at uh, equal distance from each other and and all the angles are symmetrical. So um, that was the old strategy for distance planes. You just throw it really hard at a forty five degree angle, 
and it would do this you know parabolic arc because of gravity and kind of crash into the finish line. And that was how it was done. That's how I started to do it. What was the innovation you came up with? What was the shift? What did you, uh, what did you do to beat that record? Well, uh, my thrower actually couldn't throw as far as the old world record with that kind of playing. Um, and so I couldn't throw it that far, and my thrower couldn't throw it. He's a professional football player. So uh, I figured if we can't get there with a really strong throw, we're going to have to change the kind of plane. So what I did is build a real flying machine, a glider. It's got a, a real, you know, uh, wingspan. It's the wingspan is uh, much closer to six inches um, on my plane, and the old kind of plane took about three seconds to go two hundred feet, and mine takes about nine seconds. Oh wow! And when you watch the video, you can see that Joe releases the plane almost level. The plane climbs on its own, uh, drops over the top, and then really flares on that last third and glides, you know, gently across the finish line rather than crashing into it. Here's where we start to bump up against the limits of the podcasting medium. I think people should probably take a second and, like, do an image search or even take a look at the video to see uh, what we're talking about here. How can people see this world record plane? Like, where is this video located? So shortest route to get there is probably just to search for world record paper airplane or John Collins world record. Um, and that will get you to my YouTube channel where there's um, – a uh, great video of the plane flying, um, folding instructions if they want to try to fold the plane themselves. Uh, and there's still a $1,000 reward to use my plane and break my record. That was our worst throwing day of the year. Uh, we still managed to break the old record by about 19 and a half feet. Um, but I know it's got much more distance left in it. And I want to know what somebody else can do with that. And so uh, I'm willing to, to pony up $1,000 to let someone break my record with my plane. Cool. But, so maybe take a second, take a look at the plane just to, just to see uh, how different it is than like the paper airplane you threw when you were in elementary school. But us, us on the phone here, let's back up a sec. How did you get into this? Where did you come from? Do you come from an aviation background? <laughs> That's the the most frequently asked question. So I have the I have an answer ready. Uh, I just never got out of it. <laughs> it wasn't a matter of getting into it. I I, uh, I just didn't stop. Most people get over it when they're nine or ten. And, right, uh, right. I just kept going. <laughs> so this is just like you just like be building paper airplanes as a kid. I mean, I relate to this because like I like video games as a kid, and like I'm still playing them, you know. And so is it is it just that like you just never you just always had an interest in paper airplanes? Yeah, and then uh, I I took up uh, origami, you know, the the art of Japanese paper folding, and mm -hmm. studied that for about ten years, and um, and I still do that. It's still fun. And I was one of the first people to really take all of those folding tricks, those techniques, back to high-performance paper airplanes. Mm. Usually when people get interested in making a plane that really performs well, they they give up on the purity of just folding. And so um, – and for you know, for good reason, you, you you put that bag of tricks aside, pick up a new bag of tricks. You know, let's let's try cutting, let's try pasting and taping, and you know, kind of. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool just to be able to, with one sheet of paper, create a really superior flying machine? Uh, and so that was you know the way I went after the first couple of books I wrote, and um, it was the way that I had originally approached breaking the world record. Although Guinness does allow one piece of sticky tape, one 25 millimeter by 30 millimeter piece of light duty sticky tape, they call it scotch tape, right? Um, and you can cut that into as many pieces as you like. But once you kind of make the concession that you're going to use tape, which I was, I was really slow to, to get there on the tape, I really didn't want to. Uh, but once you make that concession, it does make some things easier, makes some things more complicated, but it definitely makes some things easier uh, and so I went down that that rabbit hole, eventually cutting that one piece of tape into 16 little pieces and applying them on st uh, strategic locations on the plane to unitize the body so it could survive the the stresses of the throw. What are some of the techniques that you borrowed from origami and brought into the world of paper airplanes? Well, the, the first thing you discover with paper airplanes uh, or with origami is that tiny errors at the beginning add up to giant errors at the end. And so this is – it's – um, with a lot of different folding techniques, if you if you just make the smallest of errors, uh, because you're going to reuse that reference fold and use it again and and you know fold against that, you it really gets additive by the time you get to the end of a model. And then there are other techniques where you you kind of fudge a little bit, where you don't fold all the way to the crease. You give yourself a little breathing room so that the layers will fit together nicely without tearing. So those sort of technical ideas um, just made me a better paper airplane builder. Uh, you know, accuracy of folding, the crispness of the fold, 
the um, symmetry on the model. You know, when you're trying to get a model to stand up on four legs, it's really important for you to have both sides match. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to lean over. Uh, so all those uh, little things, those all those uh, things that, that are really under the category of attention to detail, I guess, uh, incredibly important. And then um, there are all sorts of bases and all sorts of moves that you can do that Im can improve the the look uh, and feel of the plane. Uh, for instance, I started making planes with landing gear. No one had really kind of done that the way that I did it. Um, and my latest book has a couple of locking techniques to lock the plane's nose together so that the wings don't flop open in flight, which really uh, keeps the plane, uh, makes it low drag because the nose is smooth. And it really allows you to precisely set the dihedral angle, which is uh, the angle that the wings lead the body of the plane, which ends up being super important to all paper airplanes and the world record plane. How much of your your building skill is this engineering and just developing a locking technique, and how much of it is the execution and just being able to do that? I guess what I'm wondering is, like, how I, – I you know, have you ever seen those things online where someone tries to do something on Pinterest and then they post the original picture they're trying to do and then they post, like, their complete disaster and they're like, nailed it. <laughs> nailed <And> it. <laughs> is that what's going to happen if I try to do one of your paper airplanes? I, I guess I'm just wondering, like, how much of it is, you know, the, the ability to, like – innovate and come up with locking techniques and how much of it and is execution something you also have to practice well um anybody can learn the execution part that's just uh you know doing it a bunch of times you know you don't nobody paints a wall perfectly when you're repainting your walls at home in your apartment or your house or whatever you know it you have to work with the artifice you have to learn how a paintbrush works and you have to learn how to fold paper but would you and say so it's more like painting your walls or painting a picture well, just uh, picking up a book and learning how to fold somebody else's plane is more like painting a wall. If you're going to start inventing your own planes, then uh, it is more like painting a picture. There's a um, – you kind of have to uh, throw a bunch of planes, fold a bunch of planes, and, and see how the balance of all of these things work. You know, um, rectangular planes, rectangular paper airplanes – require that you put a lot of uh, layers in the nose. Almost half of the, the weight of the plane is going to be right there in the nose of the plane. If that's if you decide that you're going to do a rectangular shape. If you're going to do more of a delta wing shape, you can move some of the layers off of the nose and further back on the wings. And so, you know, the way I think about it is a little bit like um, if the plane were just going to uh, float straight down. So if, you, if it's going to parachute straight down, the nose could be so, sort of, in effect, heavier if it's uh, pointier shaped, if it's triangular shaped rather than rectangular shaped. So, uh, you know, think of like a desk calendar that would float straight down. It's rectangular shape. If I make one side of the desk calendar, you know, pointier, you know, like the peak on a house. So now I've got one side of the desk calendar that's pointier. It's not um, – being resisted by so much air. Now that side of the calendar is going to be faster. So now it'll fall lopsided. So, you know, I kind of visualize that idea as I'm folding a little bit. Um, and then, you know, basic control techniques, you know, rudder control, elevator control, um, not so much aileron. It's the, the back of the plane really acts more like an elevon. You can control uh, some lift and speed characteristics um, just by making what would be a, an elevator adjustment on a regular plane. You're throwing out a lot of words I don't understand. How much of this knowledge translates to, you know, traditional aviation and actual planes, non-paper airplanes? <clears throat> um, most things are the same. There are a few kind of important differences, and they, they have to do with the size of the wing. So when you talk about um, controlling uh, up and down on the plane, that's elevator, and that's just – uh, bending the trailing edge of the wing uh, right at the at the tail of the plane, up or down. You can get the plane to climb or dive. Uh, rudder works very similar. You can make the plane turn right or left, again, by bending the vertical surface at the back of the plane, right or left. Um, and as you're looking at the back of the plane, uh, it really is simply bending the back right to go right, left to go left. It's that simple, uh, up to go up, uh, down to go down. So you can control the plane easily that way. The biggest difference in paper airplanes to full-size planes uh, is something called scale effect, where um, the air appears to behave differently on the plane. I say appears because the air molecules behave perfectly consistently uh, for their size. Uh, but on a big wing, a, uh, a curved surface on the top tends to happen very gently over more distance. And when you scale that down, 
to a, a paper airplane size, now suddenly the curve is happening faster over a really tiny distance. And so air molecules, if you think of them like a car going around a corner, let's say, uh, you can't go around a corner at 50 miles per hour if the corner's at a right angle, right? You, you have to slow down and go around that corner. So air molecules behave the same way on little wings. It's tougher for them to go around that corner. So small scale wings tend to have less laminar flow. That is, the, the air doesn't tend to smoothly follow the shape of the wing so much as be a little bit more turbulent. Uh, and so it's, it's a little more chaotic flow. And so you can do things to a small wing to get that flow to um, approximate laminar flow. It seems like you know and have learned so much about aeronautics. Do you have any, like, you know, above average interest in planes and flying an actual plane or designing actual planes? <laughs> well, it just seems like you're halfway I, I, there. I don't think you have to. It just seems like you, you basic. it's, to my, uh, from my perspective, it sounds like you're basically already there. I, I love flight. Uh, everything, uh, everything has, um, you know, when you look at bees and birds and uh, model aircraft and full-size aircraft, um, these things all fly uh, amazingly well, and they, they use different techniques to do it. Right. And to me, that's the interesting part. That's that the cool. really fun part. How, how is a flapping machine? How's a, why does a bird not need a rudder? How come they don't need vertical rudders like every other flying machine that you, you look at? Uh, and, and that comes down to some really interesting stuff, too, about the angle that their wingtips um, change uh, to get them to turn right and left. And it, I, I'm just endlessly fascinated by this stuff. Uh, the NASA's, NASA guys have just successfully modeled or, or built a remote control plane that uses this uh, wingtip uh, technique. And um, what they've discovered may actually lead to a whole different shape for modern airliners, uh, passenger planes. Uh, without vertical tails, uh, because they've they've discovered to uh, a way to co-opt this the thing that birds do naturally <laughs> without knowing anything about aerodynamics. <laughs> do you are you able to use any of that and build you know non-traditional paper airplanes? Maybe trick paper airplanes that do unexpected things. Um, yeah, and really, my approach is to uh, to just play, and um, I'll come up with a plane that does that does something that I don't expect. Um, it'll have some weird behavior in the flight and then I'll start researching why is it doing that how does it um, how does it do what it's doing and so what's one of those that you like recently came across um, well if you go back to my second book the the two planes that um, are really sort of stunning in the in that book the the boomerang plane which is you see it in the finals at um, uh, Red Bull in Austria every, every three years you'll see that boomerang plane flying because it just reliably circles and it circles right or circles left and does a loop and when you um, dig down in that, it's really all the same trick. And it's based on this idea that the angle, uh, uh, that the wings are attached to the body, called dihedral angle. And um, when, when you research it, you find out that the Wright brothers did a negative dihedral angle design. Most aircraft have positive dihedral angle. That is, the wings slope upward as they leave the body of the plane. And uh, that gets the center of lift up over the center of gravity. So the plane kind of rocks back to neutral. It's a little bit like a pendulum action. Uh, and when you defeat that, the plane will stay at the angle that you throw it. And then if you just put the center of gravity a little bit behind the center of lift, it'll have a tendency to climb. So if you can imagine leaning the plane to one side and throwing it, now it's climbing its way in a circle back to you. And so I didn't know much about dihedral angle uh, and the importance, you know, historically from the Wright brothers on. Um, and certainly didn't know that that was the main thing that was causing that plane to circle. You know, I thought I'd done some sort of clever thing with the... Uh, um, the shape of the wings, uh, other than dihedral angle, it turns out, no, it's th that was the really simple basic concept, and I had stumbled across a plane that really demonstrated that. And, uh, you know, it, you, you find things like that in the folding. I have a plane that flaps its wings. It how, me... Wait, how does that work? How does the plane flap its wings? <laughs> well, <laughs> exactly. So it, was, it started out with just a really subtle twitch when you threw it, and I'm going, how's it, what is it, how's that possible? How could that possibly be happening? <clears throat> and then so there's a thing called wing loading. You can uh, make a, a plane uh, out of much lighter material, and because the wings don't have to work quite as hard to lift uh, the same weight, if, the, if exactly the same shape and size plane is lighter, it'll just be able to fly slower. So I, what I did is I took the plane that was kind of doing this twitching thing and folded it out of really super lightweight paper so I could slow down the flight and figure out what was going on. And when you slow it down and look at it, 
you can see that the plane is actually going through a rapid series of stalls. And when you make the paper, uh, make it out of really lightweight paper so that the center of the plane is even more flexible, now the, the wings get sort of pressed together as the plane is climbing to the apex of the stall. At the apex, no more pressure, the wings relax and droop back down and the plane falls and stalls and falls and stalls. And so that stalling motion, um, it actually makes the plane look appears though it's flapping to fly and so it, it's really kind of fun to to get a plane that's doing something goofy figure out how it's doing that and then magnify that then actually design for it that, that's just my process i just you know i play until something goofy happens <laughs> i'm trying to picture like this does, like where do you design these planes like do you have a garage like tell, tell me about like is there a computer involved how much paper do you have like i'm imagining just like re reams of paper <laughs> And like a waste paper uh, bin with just like crumpled up, just like you know, pieces of paper just overflowing out of it. Like, wh where are you doing all of this? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I have a uh, a storage area that I've sort of converted to what my wife and I <laughs> laughingly refer to as the global headquarters for the paper airplane guy. And so uh, there's a table down there that I fold. I have a a, a piece of plexiglass um, that's about. Uh, Three quarters of an inch thick that I I put down it so it's a consistent folding surface every time, uh, and a lot of times I will I mean these days it certainly wasn't the case when I was starting out but these days I can do a lot of the folding in my head, um, and then if it looks like an intriguing idea I'll come up with a, a folding idea kind of work it out uh, mentally, and then when I get to the point where I can't really visualize the next few steps then I'll actually go about the the business of folding it. So no computers involved in this process. No, and that is, um, you know, I do a lot of presentations for museums and, and schools and, and things like that to get kids excited about science. And, and the biggest thing to me, um, it, most kids don't think they can do science uh, because when they see the rest of the world doing science, it re they feel like it requires computers and, uh, you know, linear accelerators and, uh, you know, all, all this crazy stuff. It's, no, it's, science is just a way of figuring stuff out. Um, being able to come up with a theory that works that has utility for getting to the next step. And so, um, no, you don't need computers or the rest of that. You can just uh, noodle around with it, play with it, uh, come up with your own ideas and test, test them rigorously. And that's your laboratory is just a sheet of paper. All you need is a sheet of paper and, and an idea. And uh, the scientific methods built into that paper airplane. You, uh, you'll throw it, you'll, it'll do something you don't expect, or it'll fly in a way that you want to change. So then you make a guess about how to fix that, how to correct that, how to get it to do what you want. Uh, you design an experiment, uh, you know, make an adjustment on the plane, and then you know, the, the actual experiment is the throw, and you immediately get results, and can, you know, the, the loop starts all over again. Was it the result you expected? You know, do you have another idea for why that might work better? So this whole idea of of making an educated guess, designing an experiment, doing the experiment, getting the results and analyzing them, it's all built into every paper airplane throw. And so it's the perfect, really super inexpensive lab to, uh, to learn science, learn how science works. And um, <laughs> when I explain that to, to uh, uh, museum people and, and kids, they get a kick out of it because they, they didn't know they were doing science. <laughs> but they, <laughs> I snuck it right in there. Suckers, you guys are doing science. How much paper do you own? Like, how are you buying paper? Like I, I have a few reams of paper. <laughs> I, yeah, we're, so right now I probably have, uh, you know, I'm going to guess, uh, hmm, probably uh, 4,000 sheets of paper or so. And some of that is 24-pound uh, paper. Like, I have to make planes that, that are going to travel with me. Uh, I have to make that out of uh, slightly thicker paper because they get sandwiched between sheets of cardboard so I can get them all packed into one suitcase. Um, you know, it's about, um, you know, with backups, it, it's about 48 to 50 planes that all have to travel with me pre-folded. It takes about eight hours to fold a set of planes for a, a presentation. So you, you don't want to do that on site. You want to have all that done. Um, so I've got thicker paper for that. Uh, regular 20 pound paper is what I use for demonstrations when I don't have to, um, you know, pack the planes. Mm -hmm. that, they work just fine with that. And then I have um, some, uh, 100 GSM A4 paper in, in uh, about three different paper stocks. That's the paper that's used for the world record plane. Um, I have some some phone book paper. <laughs> it, it's That's getting more rare. I designed these planes that you could fly with a piece of cardboard. You can fly them for minutes at a time. And when I started playing with this idea, 
um, I guess it's it's all it must be 20 years ago. Phone books were everywhere. You could they dropped them off at your doorstep, right? And it was just mm-hmm. a simply a lightweight, readily available paper that everybody had access to. And now you tell people you're making planes out of phone book paper, and they look at you like, "What? <laughs> What's a phone book? <laughs> Is that like a book about how to use my iPhone?" Or <laughs> exactly. So you know. What, what, what's your burn rate? Like, how quickly are you going through paper? Like, I, I imagine you're at Office Depot every week. Um, yeah, it's probably not that dramatic. Uh, I can uh, – a, a good set of planes will last for, uh, you know, half a dozen shows. So I'm not – Oh, interesting. Uh, you know, I can I can reuse them, um, even even planes that the audience pick up and, and fly back, which they do with almost every plane. So it's kind of a fun fun part of the show for them is they get to demo the planes. Um, you, you know – they're fairly resilient, you know, unless they somebody really crunches one, with like a, a you know a toddler picks it up and really does the old crunch move on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can usually get it back in flying shape. So you know, the, you, you lose maybe fifteen to twenty percent of your planes on a, a day where you do two or three shows, and uh, you know you're ready for that. You got backups, and so um, and when I'm sitting down and, and inventing planes, yeah, I go through. I'll probably you know, litter the floor with uh, 50 or 60 sheets of paper over a, a three hour period. So I can, uh, I can fold pretty fast and I can go through a lot of paper. Um, but fortunately, um, the paper that works the best for folding, the absolute best is uh, paper that's been photocopied onto once. So the heat process stiffens the paper a little bit. Ooh, good tip. And the printing is actually a microfine layer of plastic, which also helps the paper hold a crease. So if you don't want to save the planet, I get it. Uh, but if you want to make the best possible paper airplane, just repurpose some old photocopies before they, you know, get to the recycle machine. That is your your best source right there. Not just printed paper, not not inkjet printed, but actual photocopy process. You know, where you have that heat. It sounds like you've done a ton of shows, which I totally get. It sounds like a great, uh, really fun thing. Like it's it sounds like a really fun show. Is there one that you've done that stands out in your mind? Like, I can't believe I'm getting to talk about paper airplanes here to these people. Yeah, I have a couple of shows like that. <laughs> the biggest one uh, was uh, this this private event that Google does every year. It's called Google Zeitgeist, uh, and they invent or they invite um, really it's C level executives and up. And so the the group that that I talked in two years uh, ago had. Morgan Spurlock, you know, uh, the, the guy who did Super Size Me and has a, a show on CNN. It had Campbell Brown was moderating. Uh, it had um, Ron Howard's uh, a producing partner. Uh, I can't remember. Brian his. Grazier, maybe? Exactly. Brian Grazier. So, <laughs> and, and the paper airplane guy. So, we, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's this group of. But I bet you were a hit. Like, I bet you're a lot. No, I mean, Brian Grazier made, among many other great things, Arrested Development. So, like, he has eternal respect for me. But, like, I I bet you I bet you uh, I bet you're a great speaker. Like I bet that's a lot of fun. People come alive, right? It it well they just don't expect it. They think well paper airplanes. And so uh, my my ally is the modest expectation. When they say a guy is going to throw paper airplanes, uh, they have no idea that I'm going to show up with with planes that can you know tear across the room, make it all the way across 100 feet, no problem. You know one that'll glide really slowly, just sort of float over their heads. One that flaps its wings. The, the tube spins and flies like a football. <clears throat> the one, you know, one that goes up and, and drops a helicopter, you know, so Wait, all this what? stuff. And then it, how does it yeah, do so, a, like how does it do something once it's in air? Like how do, how do you control that? Well, you, you, you have to. It's just design. Right. So uh, you, you make a plane that has a tendency to have a, a like a flexible center crease. So the, the body of the plane can kind of open up a little bit in flight and you trim it so that it or adjust it so that it will fly up and do a loop. So on the way up, the wings are kind of pressed together a little bit. From the pressure of the climb, once it gets to the apex of the loop, the wings relax a little bit, just enough to deploy the helicopter. Oh, that's so neat. <laughs> I mean, what do you want people to take away from the show when they're there? Like, what is the, what is the thrust of the show? So um, it's it's really just, uh, you know, I'm like a bad uh, magician. Uh, I'm the guy who who does all these tricks and then explains the tricks to you so that you can do them yourself. <laughs> so uh, it's really teaching people a little bit about aerodynamics, a little bit about, you know, uh, perseverance. You know, breaking the record wasn't easy. It was really just, you know, staying at it. Um, and the main thing is to put the, the idea of doing science in, in people's hands, to give them the idea that they can do this. And um, it's it's just a structured way of figuring stuff out. And How long have, did it take you from saying I'm going to set the record to ha- holding that Guinness certificate in your hands? It it was three years. 
it was a three year kind of idea and, and, you know, finding, finding a thrower and finding a throwing space and, and then, uh, you know, coming up with a design that could do it. It, it, it was, there were plenty of places, let's put it this way. There were plenty of places where it would have been perfectly acceptable to just bow out and go, you know what? <laughs> I, I've gone as far as I can go, <laughs> but, uh, but I didn't. I kept going. Why and, did you? Like, wh- wh- what was it about the record for paper airplanes that, like, excited you so? Well, I, I think I started into it with with just uh, nothing more than some hubris. I, I'm a pretty good paper airplane designer. I, Sounds I like a, it, yeah. <laughs> but I thought I was the best in the world. And you don't know what you don't know going into it. It's, yeah. really, it's really that simple. Once you get into a space that's 100 feet or 200 feet, which that's difficult to go throw in a space. So you have to find somebody that's sympathetic to your cause. Right, because you don't, you can't do it outside because of wind, right? So we're, I'm imagining, so where do you do it? Well, uh, you have to uh, have a friend that will let you into a large gymnasium or so, uh, somebody who uh, has ac- access to an aircraft hangar. When you're going to break the record, that's about the, the only 200-foot indoor space with a tall enough ceiling is an aircraft hangar. So, um, you know, you can you can practice to some extent outside to kind of work on, um, you know, trajectory, basic wing shape, stuff like that, get, get a plane solid enough, solid enough to survive the throw. But when it comes down to actually, you know, doing it indoors in the same environment that you're going to try to break the record, then it gets tricky. Then you really have to have a place to practice. Take um, me through that three-year journey from, like, I'm going to set the record to actually doing it. How many, like, iterations did you go through? I imagine the one you actually did it with looked <laughs> nothing like the thing you thought it would look like when you started the process, right? Yeah, well, you know, in my mind, I had... Uh, uh, I'd written two books at that point, and I figured these six planes. I'm going to try these six planes from the, these two books, and uh, I, I must have a winner here. You know, I mean, who's making planes better than me? And uh, <laughs> oh is there boy. anyone like is? Do you have a rival on this field? Oh, there's tons of them, and you know, I I think it's going to be some random fifth grader that that knocks me out of the box. <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> it'll just be some guy who just uh, looks at what I've done and and says, "Yeah, I could just do that a little bit better." Um, so what, what was lacking? Like, what did you discover in those three years like, um, that you didn't have when you started that enabled you to set the record? Well, the first thing that had to change was the approach. Uh, the, the actual uh, design of the plane went from being a dart, just a, a, a plane that you would just throw hard with a lot of muscle, uh, to a real flying machine. And then once we transitioned to the flying machine idea, uh, this is we made two official uh, world record attempts, and the first one was in Mojave down at the uh, spaceship hangar, where their uh, you know scaled composites in the spaceship company are, are building this you know this series of planes that are going to take tourists into space. So we were down there, and two weeks before uh, the world record attempt there, we had these planes that were a whole set of them that were going halfway down the hangar, making a U turn and, and flying back, and that is. Uh, a nearly impossible thing to wrap your head around. I had no idea, without a pilot on board, how a paper airplane could fly in one direction, make a U-turn, and then fly straight back. Did not, <laughs> should not be happening. <clears throat> and we, it was a, a frustrating day. And so uh, the guy who is the designer of the ignition system on the rocket motor uh, was watching all this happen, and he's kind of scratching his head with the rest of us. And, Just and clear, uh, literally a rocket scientist. Literally, a, I had a rocket scientist on my side. <laughs> And so this guy is uh, is thinking about it. He goes, well, you know, what could be happening? It's a small scale wing. And so the airflow might not be consistent over the, the different set of speeds. So the air might be coming off the wing at a different place as the plane slows down. Um, and sure enough, when I took all the planes home and uh, took them apart, you could see that there was a very particular error in a very particular place on every wing of the plane, so that uh, on the right hand wing. And so the plane would fly fast, straight, start to slow down, encounter this anomaly on the right-hand wing. As the plane slowed down, the air could adhere further back on the wing. It encountered this anomaly, which caused the plane to make a turn. The plane slowed down further. The airflow uh, adhered further back. It got past the anomaly, and the plane straightened out again. And so we had proved without trying that the speed that a paper airplane is traveling uh, really affects where the air separates from the wing. And I had no idea what to do with that. It was just kind of a pain in the ass at the time. And I started, you know, making sure that the wings were perfect on each side, perfectly symmetrical. And then um, for the second world record attempt, um, we switched paper stocks to a smoother paper stock. And where the layers end on the uh, on the wing, 
you could see a, a little more of a, a dramatic change in the angle that the wings were hooked to the body of the plane. And that got me interested in optimizing dihedral angle. And then that led to uh, this discovery or, or the utilization of, of this other problem, which if you take dihedral angle, it, that stabilizes the plane, right? We talked about the upward sweep uh, helping stabilize the plane. The thing that it adds, though, is drag. So in a perfect world, if you had a paper airplane with no dihedral angle when it was flying very, very fast, and you could somehow magically crank up the dihedral angle when the plane slowed down, you would have this amazing flying machine. And so that's what the world record plane does. It has flat dihedral angle at the nose so that when it's flying very fast, it uh, has lower drag. And then as the plane slows down and the air adheres further back, I crank up the dihedral angle at mid-wing. So you just fold in a little more dihedral angle mid-wing, flat dihedral angle at the nose, and now magically, as the plane slows down, it, it encounters higher dihedral angle and continues to fly straight uh, during the glide phase. And so this idea of optimizing the dihedral angle based on the speed that the plane's flying, that had not been tried before. And it ended up um, you know, it b being the thing that pushed us over the line. How did you find your thrower? Actually, to back up a sec, at what point did you realize I'm going to need a thrower? <laughs> well, I, that was kind of obvious at the outset. I figured that I had these this great set of planes, and all I really needed was, you know, uh, a hired hand, a hired gun. Uh, and so um, I have some connections in the sporting world. I know some guys who work for uh, the the local sports channel here in San Francisco Bay Area. So uh, they they hooked me up with a quarterback, and we went went to a gym and I thought, all right, well, this is just going to take a practice session or two with this guy. We'll get the, the plane dialed in for him and presto change, I'll be a world record holder. <clears throat> Nothing could be further from the truth. This guy had such large, powerful hands. He was kind of crushing the planes and I couldn't really see what he was doing with them. And, you know, I wasn't aware of how much force he was going to have to apply to the plane and what that would do to the plane during launch. And so we were scattering planes all over this gym and nothing was flying straight and nothing was working. And I was making planes go further than this guy who could throw a football 85 yards. And so it was like, ah, oh, it was a total disaster. And so I had to really uh, go back and rethink of that whole idea. And so I, I changed throwers to a guy with, with smaller hands who, who had um, kind of a snappier kind of a throw. Uh, and while he was, he had more time uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, his availability, uh, it, it turned out that his throw was really uh, the worst kind of throw you could imagine. He was ripping planes in half. He had such a snappy throw. Uh, you know, when you think about how quarterbacks play the game, they scan the field, and then it's all about an explosive kind of throw, uh, you know, out there toward the target at the last moment. And he was that in spades. I mean, he had such an incredibly uh, fast acceleration on his throwing motion that he, he literally ripped planes in half. And then, um, and then I met Joe. Uh, Joe was the third guy. Uh, Joe had played for Cal uh, and had a he had uh, a junior college uh, career where he had just one loss over a two year period. <laughs> you know, so here's a guy who knows the game, knows how to throw, and is a heck of a competitor. And and he loved paper airplanes. He loves paper airplanes. And so, in in a lot of ways, the perfect guy. And um, over uh, an 18 month period of working with Joe, he figured out a way to smoothly accelerate the plane. Um, it changed the way his follow through motion worked. He changed uh, his throwing method to a more elbow down kind of style to help the wings release at a level angle um, and, and worked on a way of holding the plane that could compensate for a, a rock to the left or a rock to the right um, in, the, in the launch phase. So really, you know, he was important to the process in ways that I had not imagined. I just figured going into this thing, I just need a strong arm. And it turns out you really have to know how to throw <laughs> in addition to that. You really got to, you know, and you have, you have to be willing to work. So what was the record again? How far did the paper airplane travel? So a little bit more than 75 yards, 226 feet. Gotcha. So that helps me imagine the indoor space. How far could, how important is the throwing technique? And I guess what I'm wondering is like, how far could I throw that plane? Very, very weak arms, zero athletic ability. I'm just absolutely zero none so like how far i just can't stress that part enough how far am i gonna get it so you would you would magically be transformed into a paper airplane god because uh this plane will go with with no knowledge about a throw it, it'll go 100 feet so from one end of the average gymnasium to the other so if a basketball court just fits in into the gymnasium that you're throwing in 
you could stand on one end and throw it all the way to the other end with this plane. So 100 feet, no problem. You don't have to know anything about throwing. Uh, if you get the folding right, it'll fly 100 feet for you. And how so, far can you throw it? So I've actually thrown it 215 feet. So I've actually exceeded the old world record with just my arm. But that is, that's having the luxury of having this guy who's much more powerful throw it a bunch of times so I could get the plane dialed into the point where it would, it would do that for me. So I, I do think that the plane, the design of the plane uh, and, and the build of the plane is, is to a point where the av- a person with an average arm or a, a slightly better than average arm has a shot at breaking the record. Uh, it's it's really that good of a plane now. Was it, it at all difficult to talk a quarterback, you know, potentially uh, a jock-ish person into something that's maybe, uh, let's say, a slight, uh, could be perceived as a, a nerdy hobby, paper airplanes? Was there at all like a culture clash there trying to just uh, convince them that this was a, a, something worth pursuing? You know what? I, it, it, I never got that particular vibe. I think the... Um, the thing that gets him in the tent uh, is the we're going to be the best in the world idea. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and these guys are all, all of them were just, you're, you're the quarterback, you're the team leader, you're used to being the guy people listen to, and you're used to winning. And the idea of being the best in the world just fit right in there for them. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, it's a little bit goofy. It's, it's definitely, uh, you know, I, my joke is, you know, I went from being the crazy guy to the eccentric guy because now I'm a world record holder. So <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to be eccentric for a change. <laughs> what do people, you know, when they're just making a paper airplane, kind of the way everyone makes, you know, I think there's like a standard, like close your eyes and imagine a paper airplane, like a thing people know how to do. What are people doing wrong? What do most people do wrong when they try to make a paper airplane? Yeah, well, first of all, you shouldn't be making that plane. Just uh, take take one more step up and and uh, either do uh, a Nakamura lock, which uh, holds all the layers of paper together. That's the first horrible thing about that that plane that most people learn is that it's just a terrible aircraft. The layers are flopping all around and, and yeah. crossing on one side. So it's no matter how well you fold that after a half a dozen throws, it's a disaster. So don't fold that plane. <laughs> that's the, that's thing number one. Well, well uh, what is a good first step? Like, how can people? Well, what should they do instead? So, um, there, fortunately, there's all sorts of great designs online. I mean, my world record plane is online. There, but the, if you're just going to learn one plane that you know that you're going to use the rest of your life, uh, you know, it should be one of mine. But if it's not one of mine, uh, do uh, Google Nakamura Lock, and that is N A K A M U R A uh, Lock, like like a padlock. Um, and there's a that's a really simple plane to fold, and it's got this locking technique that holds all the layers together. Very forgiving design. You can make tons of mistakes. It'll still fly well. Um, so it's, it's a little bit like the Phoenix design in, in my first book, um, or the, uh, you know, there's the first half dozen designs in the second book are all very simple, uh, fantastic flight. And then there's some real easy designs in the, my New World Champion book. But, you know, start with a design that, that will help you, <laughs> not, not hurt you. And then, um, attention to detail is, is really important. There's, a, I teach a technique, uh, you know, most people just bogey this, the very first fold that they make, they, they bogey folding the, the paper in half. There's a, a better way to fold the page in half than you're probably doing. And that is, you know, line up all four corners and then where the crease is going to be, start from the middle of that crease and sweep toward the ends. And that way you're not going to magnify one small error from one end of the page to the other. You're going to you know, create symmetry in this thing right from the get-go. So start with making a good, accurate crease to fold the plane in half, to fold the page in half. Uh, and then, you know, accurate folding, really good idea. Crisp creases, very sharp creases. Unlike full-size planes, you want the wings of a paper airplane to be very, very flat. The plane's going to fly much better with flat wings rather than curved wings. Um, and then most people can can actually fold a decent plane. And even though they, they say, no, I, I've never folded a good paper airplane, that's probably not true. You've probably folded a good one, but where it falls apart is the adjusting. It, it is a flying machine, and so you have to take the time to make a bunch of trial throws, figure out what the plane is doing, and make subtle adjustments to correct for that. So really crisp, accurate folding. Um, have the, the wings leave the body of the plane at a slight upward sweep. We've talked about dihedral angle a couple of times. 
a, a very you know slight V shape in that wing and allow for the, the body of the plane to flop open. Really important. You can't just hold it with the body of the plane closed and go, okay, I got positive dihedral angle, and then the plane flops open and now the wings are drooping again. That positive dihedral angle helps rock the plane back to neutral if it rocks to one side. And then um, if you're going to throw the plane really hard or throw outside, probably a little bit of up elevator. And it doesn't take much, but a little tiny upward bend at the trailing edge will keep the plane, uh, you know, keep the nose of the plane up. So those things, just, you know, having some care with the folding and then taking some time to do some test flying and adjusting. Uh, you know, most people just go, they'll fold it and they'll throw it and they'll, uh, uh, it was a failure, it didn't fly. But Well, then the teacher uh, took it. Yeah, no, well, <laughs> yeah, important safety tip, do not throw at the teacher. Yeah, <laughs> probably a bad idea. Uh, so, yeah, uh, take some time to adjust. That's, you, you won't know whether you folded a great plane or not until you test fly it a half a dozen times and kind of get the kinks out. And then if people want to go deeper than that, you've written several books on the subject. What are those books about? So the gliding flight was really that first um, – is the fruition of that idea of taking all of these origami techniques back to high performance planes. So there were, there were great darts, great gliders, um, some origami ideas. Uh, the Starfighter in there has a hexagonal shaped wing. It, it actually won an international distance competition, not, not Guinness, but um, because it had to survive shipping. So that hexagonal shape helped it survive shipping. Uh, you know, interesting planes like the Swan plane and you know, the tube. So that's kind of was the first book. And then um, that's the gliding flight. And then Fantastic Flight. I got interested in having planes that just did really bizarre things. So the boomerang plane is in there. The plane that flies out, flips over, and flies back upside down is in there. Um, the, the bat plane, the one that flaps its wings. So I was really trying to see how far I could push the craziness <laughs> in fantastic flight. So there's, a, there's even an airplane in there that's a canard design. It's got a small wing in front. And these are all uh, – those two books are just all about folding, just a single piece of paper. Even if you're doing landing gears, even if you're doing a, a, a forward wing in the front um, – or even the, the, like, the biplane that's actually two sheets folded together. Uh, just cool ideas with just folding. Um, so those are the first two books. And then the third book was really just, you know, the celebration of, of that world record. You know, here's the, the process, kind of start to finish. Uh, here's where I started. Here's why we changed. Here's how it ended up. Uh, and then some, you know, a couple of other really interesting folding ideas, a couple of nose locking techniques that will... Um, you know, if you kind of learn the mechanics there, you can start designing your own planes and build these techniques into your own planes uh, for, you know, if you're if you're going to do that. So the goal with, you know, when you look at all three of the books put together and particularly the last book, um, it was made with an idea of getting people to a point where they could design their own planes, give them enough information that they could really kind of take all these techniques and start mixing and matching. In your mind, do you think there's like a theoretical maximum to this? Is it like running the mile where we're only, you know, we're, we're getting to as good as it we can possibly be at it? Or is the future wide open? No, I think the future is wide open. I think, uh, you know, that the record that had stood for nine years, you know, people might have assumed that that's as far as you could get with that kind of a dart, which I think is probably close to true. I think with the ballistic dart idea, that's as far as you get. Um, so you have to change the idea, right? And, you know, if, if that's as far as you can throw a stick with fins with that, uh, of that paperweight, then, you know, let's, let's do something else to, to go further. So I think now that the, the whole nature of the beast has been changed, this is the first distance world record plane that's a glider. It's not going to be the only one. <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's just the first one in what will probably be a very long series of gliders that will eventually make mine sort of look silly. I would guess. I, I think, you know, 100 yards is probably possible. We, we threw more than 80 yards in practice more than once. And, you know, you'll get into a better throwing space. You know, ours had sort of lighting instruments around that were uh, 45 feet up. And so you'd bang into those every once in a while. Mm -hmm. So you don't. The reality is nobody knows how far my plane goes. And my plane is just one possible solution in the glider realm. So it's not the you know, not the only possible solution. It's just a, you know, that was the series of compromises I came up with uh, as a way to break the record. I, I, you know, I'm the exciting thing is we've switched paradigms. We switched from this ballistic dart idea to a flying machine idea. And that, that means it's jump ball again. <laughs> we're, we're, we're wide, wide open. Uh, and the, and the time off record has just been broken twice by this guy, uh, Takua Toda. Um, and it's now it's 29.2 seconds. That is an amazingly long time for a paper airplane to be in the air with just one throw. And when you look at what he's done, 
switching from that sort of that box shape, rectangular shape that Ken Blackburn was using back to this really cool delta wing shape. Um, I think we're in another uh, another realm there as well. I think we're, you know, in a really interesting flying machine idea with what he's doing as well. And, you know, I've got a couple of ideas for time aloft planes that I'm playing with. So um, if either one of those works out, that'll that's going to change things dramatically too. I, I'm not saying that it will, but, you know, I've got a couple of ideas. Is this a global community where or is it primarily something that Americans are interested in? No, it's completely global. It's when you look at the uh, the map of where people have clicked on my world record plane, there's not a single country on the globe that doesn't have some views. So it's it's everywhere. <laughs> we walk among you. <laughs> well, I think it just speaks to like the just that core idea of just like, you know, putting aside all the science and everything, just like Every kid is thrown a paper airplane at one point, you know, like you don't have to be told like it's just obviously like a super fun th it's at its very core. It's a really fun thing to do. And every kid has that experience. It sounds like just everywhere in the world, you know, like all you need to do it is a piece of paper and uh, it's fun. And so it, it makes sense that like th there's an interest in it. There's a, an interest in it uh, globally, even as people get older. I think so. And, and the it has so many interesting layers. Um, you know, the, the, almost the more you know about the science of it, the more interesting it gets. Um, and, you know, you start comparing, you know, big wings with little wings and how they do what they do. And, and there's this, this paper airplane sized wing is a really interesting niche in the flying world. It's not big enough to perform exactly like a, a, a full size plane, but it's not small enough to have all of the same things that like an insect wing has. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's just in this, in this really interesting realm, almost of its own that, um, that makes it just fascinating, endlessly fascinating. I got to ask, what do you do when you're not building paper airplanes or is paper airplanes a full-time gig for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm hoping to turn it into a full-time gig at some point. Uh, but right now, uh, I work, uh, primarily in advertising. I, I have a, uh, a job where I'm the creator of commercials and infomercials, both radio and television. Um, so uh, I work for uh, an outfit called Peterson Dean, and they they have just started doing uh, Solar for America, which is um, it, it's a great product. It's an American-made solar power uh, system. It's like a, a kit system that you can you know figure out how many panels you need just from the size of your electric bill, and it's all American-made. It's the cheapest power, and I, you know blah 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 blah. I could do you know I can do the commercial from <laughs> <laughs> right right of course from memory, but um, so that's really kind of what I do for a living now. It's great that you are able to do that, and then on top of that, find the time to not only set a world record, but also travel around teaching kids about science and getting kids excited about science and, you know, speaking about it. And uh, I, I, it's really incredible. Congratulations. <laughs> well, thanks, Jeff. Uh, so all this stuff, the books, the videos, designs, you can find it all on the website, right? Or it's all linked to on the website. Yeah, it's it's uh, so there's the paper airplane guy dot com. That's a subscription site. There's a few planes for free there. There's the YouTube channel, the paper airplane guy on YouTube. Um, world record plane available there. These uh, some of the planes that you fly with uh, with a piece of cardboard. They're either called walk along wings or I call them follow foils. They ride on a wave of air that you generate with a piece of cardboard. Those are really cool. You can fly those for minutes at a time. Um, and then I'm also uh, starting to put together a, a national competition. There, there's there's not one in the U.S. right now, and it's making me crazy. Why is there no national paper airplane competition in the United States? So I'm going to invent one. <laughs> that sounds great. That's a good idea. <laughs> the National Paper Airplane Contest. Where is it going to be? It'll be in conjunction with uh, air and space museums and science museums all across the country. I love it. That's a great idea. And you're based in the Bay Area, you said, right? Yeah, San Francisco, Bay Area, just uh, just on the north end of the Golden Gate Bridge. Man, this is an episode I love podcasting, but I, I really felt myself, like I said, pushing up against the limits of podcasting here. I really hope people go and check out the videos online so they can see just like how – it's one thing to hear about these things, but it's another go look at it. And next time I'm out there, I, I'd love to stop by with a video camera, like record some of these things, and uh, it, it sounds incredible. It's really cool. Yeah, I do uh, shows around the Bay Area all the time. I'm doing Maker Fair in a couple months. This is Great. the 10th annual Maker Fair in uh, – that it's going to be crazy. It's always crazy, but this will be super crazy. That, that it's, 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 It sounds like a really cool scene. It's really interesting. It sounds like it's evolving. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for, I mean, I knew nothing about it. You blew my mind, like, in the first two minutes of this show. Uh, I was like, oh, we got a lot to talk about. So I really learned a lot. Thank you so much for taking the time to explain it all. My pleasure. Anytime. <laughs> Anytime. 
All right, you see how I am slowly but surely building hype for the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin video project, which I assure you is still coming. It is still coming. Still kind of getting my New York living situation settled, but I assure you it's probably like still a month away. But to me, it's like something I'm really starting to work on. So I'm very excited about it. And it's coming as well as more episodes of the podcast. Uh, you will hear them first. Uh, follow me on Twitter, where I'm at Jeff Rubin Show, on the Facebook fan page, uh, on Instagram, YouTube.com com slash Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin, and uh, of course, Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin show.com, where you can hear every episode of this show for free. My email address is there. I would love to hear from you. Uh, maybe suggestions. Maybe maybe you got some ideas about future uh, guests for this podcast. Got to thank William Baker for suggesting this week's wonderful guest. Thank you, William. All right. That is it. I'll see you guys in two weeks. I hope. Bye.